Good morning. So, um, the other day, I was having lunch, and I was thinking to myself that I wonder where the burger that I'm eating is coming from. What does it really take to produce it? So obviously the next thing I did was to Google it. And what I found out is that in order to produce one hamburger, you need to invest 100 meters squares for a year, just for one hamburger. It's like twice as bigger than my own apartment. Not even mentioning the water usage, the pollution of the process, and the fact that it's not just me who has to eat. There are eight billion other people out there who also need to be fed. The numbers are insane, like the food industry is so inefficient that only 5% of what we grow we actually eat, and it's twice more polluting than the entire transportation industry, more than all the planes, the trucks, the cars, all together. And then I was like, wow, I wish we could just sit in the sun, sunbathe, and get all the food we need from that. Why can't we do that? How cool would that be? Why can't we just fix carbon? Why can't we take carbon dioxide from the air and integrate it into our biomass. Why can't we be like plants? Well, the answer is that we're different than plants. Plants are autotrophs, meaning they know how to fix carbon and they use carbon dioxide to build their biomass. And we are heterotrophs. We're consuming whatever they produce for us. But what if we could convert a heterotroph into an autotroph? And I don't mean now engineering people or anything of such sort, just conceptually being able to take something that is used to eat food and emit CO2 and will now take CO2 and produce food. It can have great potential in solving many problem, problems I just mentioned. So this is exactly the question that was asked in our lab 10 years ago. And it took us that long to answer. But before I jump into the result, let me take you to the beginning. So we chose to work with E. coli. It's a model bacteria in science known for decades and therefore is really well characterized, grows fast, and we have many tools to genetically engineer it. So we thought it can be a great candidate to answer our question. We started by looking at natural autotrophs. What do they have that our E. coli is missing? The first thing is that they have a CO2 fixation cycle a chain of reactions that is enabling them to integrate carbon dioxide into their biomass. The second thing they have is an energy module that is decoupled from the carbon fixation cycle, meaning that the carbon comes from one source and energy comes from a different source. Let's say the sun or hydrogen. Okay, so we went and looked at E. coli's central metabolism, which is enzymatic pathway. We can compare it, for example, for its digestion system. And surprisingly, we found out that only two reactions, two enzymes, were missing to have a synthetic carbon fixation cycle, the Kelvin cycle, the most abundant carbon fixation cycle in nature. And for energy, only one enzyme was missing to have all the energy demand of the cell. Great. So by introducing these two modules to E. coli by three genes, we'll get autotrophic growth, right? No. <laughs> it doesn't work that easily. And basically, the explanation is that we gave E. coli the machinery, but it didn't really want to use it. We had to force it to use it. And the way we chose to approach this is that we use directed lab evolution. It means to mimic how evolution happens in nature, just not in a very long time scale, but in a short laboratory time scale. To do that, you direct the evolution towards the desired outcome. And how we did that, we took the cells and we put them in a sugar limited fermenter, meaning we starved them for sugar and gave them access of CO2, how much they want. And what happened in the chemostat, in the fermenter, sorry, is that at first they ate the sugar and used it to build the biomass. But then they ran out of sugar and they needed to find another carbon source. So they had to start using the new machinery. And we hoped that through evolution, the fraction of carbon dioxide in their biomass would increase with time until eventually we'll have a clone that can use carbon dioxide to build the entire cell. And after a lot of trial and error and many, many months of evolution, we finally did it. We got an E. coli that can grow on carbon dioxide as a sole carbon source, an autotrophic E. coli. <sighs> wow. 
We were so happy. What a great scientific achievement. And we were really eager to use it and learn from it. But we still had the dream of being able to engineer such a system. We really needed to have a compact and well-defined prototype we can learn from. The evolved strain had many mutations, and we didn't really know which one was essential and which one weren't. So we had to go back to the evolution. And we repeated it many times. Each evolution had a different outcome, a different set of mutations. And what we were interested in is the intersect, which mutations reoccurred every time independently between experiments. We took these mutations and we integrated them into an E. coli who already have the carboxylation machinery and the energy module. And it worked. We got autotrophic growth in E. coli with just engineering. We didn't need to evolve it afterwards. Wow, okay. How great was it? Only three mutations were in the set. So you can take an E. coli from the freezer, introduce two plasmids, three mutations, and you get autotrophic E. coli. Okay, this is a lot to take, so I'll repeat it again. We had an E. coli that used sugar and emitted CO2. Now we have an E. coli that also knows how to take the CO2 and integrate it to biomass. And remember, I was mentioning that we are looking for a platform for sustainable food production. So we're far from that, but we're interested in even more improvement of the system we have. We want to fuel it with renewable energy. We want it to produce something for us. E. coli is a modular system. And the vision that we have is that our engineered microbe will be fed with concentrated CO2 from air capture or different industries. The system will be fueled with renewable energy, for example, photovoltaic cells, and it can produce food for us. This type of system is very efficient. If we'll take, for example, the amount of protein we can get for microbial production, it is one order of magnitude more efficient in land use compared to soy, for example. And what is great with E. coli, as I mentioned, it is modular. It's easy to manipulate. So it doesn't need to be just food. We can also produce fuels or chemicals. So what we have here is actually a proof of concept that can later on be implemented into other organisms. We use E. coli, but what we learn can use other labs, other attempts. And potentially, we have a carbon neutral platform for bioproduction. So with that, I want to thank my lab, the people who took part of this journey, and for you for listening. Thank you.